All right. Hello. We're on. Go. Hi, everybody out there in uh, Discord land or, or streaming land. Um, I was going to say good morning, but it's noon now. Good afternoon. And um, I'm Ann Gray. I have the uh, honor of moderating this panel with all these amazing folks. And the panel topic is post-apocalyptic fiction. And um, I think we're going to find plenty of things to talk about on this, on this topic. And so we're just going to start by asking everybody to introduce themselves, uh, maybe give your pronouns if you feel like it, and just uh, you know, tell us your name and, and a bit about yourself. We'll start with Ada. Hi, uh, I'm Ada Palmer. I'm a historian. I work currently on the history of censorship uh, and history of books and printing. I'm also a science fiction novelist, best known for my Terra Ignota books, starting with starting with two like the lightning, which take place in the 25th century, although now I'm also working on some Viking stuff for the next series. And I hear you're working on an awesome um, multidisciplinary role-playing game. Yes, I've convinced my university that the best thing to do for COVID that I can contribute is instead of normal teaching, running a giant campus-wide online role-playing game where all the students are designing a new civilization to be built on a terraformed exoplanet. So the economists, me major, economics majors have to design the economy, the biology majors have to populate the ocean. Everybody's discipline is necessary and they all get to think about ways to make a better world than this one and thus about ways to make this world better. And we have more than 400 eager students all signed up. Uh, and uh, we need lots of guest experts to be non-player characters and write in-world documents. And we're really hoping to have a wide range of awesome people in different professions, but also science fiction writery people and a diverse people to be good role models for the students of awesome people that exist. So everybody who is interested in that, you can uh, you can please email me, Ada Palmer at UChicago. I would love to hear from dozens of you because uh, we can have an unlimited number of, of non-player characters to join in advising the students on the world and playing characters from other space colonies nearby, et cetera. My husband who just poked in is actually a really experienced game master and uh, would probably be excellent if you need any villains. <laughs> um, okay, let's go on to uh, Bogi. Uh, hi, I'm Bogi Tokaj, uh, they, them, or EM air pronouns. Uh, and um, I'm also a science fiction writer and a reviewer and editor. Uh, this year, I won the Hugo for Best Fan Writer, uh, and I really like to talk about books. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, step closer? Yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. And um, I am very interested in themes uh, of uh, characters working together uh, for a common goal, which is kind of relevant to the topic, I guess. Sure. Thank you. Sure. All right, Dave, you want to tell us about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm Dave Ring, uh, counselor, uh, human service by day, and then a, a speculative fiction writer, editor, and of late publisher um, as well. Um, and my interest in the apocalypse is both the aesthetic and um, mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a post-apocalyptic anthology coming out in September 15th, and it's called, uh, this is the proof, uh, Glitter and Ashes, Queer Tales of a World That Wouldn't Die. Oh, and I think I forgot to mention to you guys, if, if you have any titles like that and stuff, throw them in the chat and our chat wrangler will put them in the Discord. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so um, Premi, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, yeah, I'm uh, Premi Mohammed. I'm uh... I go by she, her, and I'm a uh, scientist by day. I work for the government in uh, environmental regulation, and I used to work uh, in heavy industry doing uh, environmental response and emergency response. And uh, I also, by night, when I have so much free time, uh, work on my fiction, and I write sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and some things that are kind of all of the above, such as my debut novel, Beneath the Rising, which they didn't know where to shelve it, uh, which is fine, but it came out anyway. <laughs> and I guess, yeah, my quote interest, unquote, in the apocalypse is because of, uh, I guess, my uh, my background is watching things get uh, busted and then try to 
use systems to build them back up. Very cool. All right, Tobias. Hi, I'm Tobias Paquel, uh, he, him, and uh, I am a uh, Caribbean born uh, science fiction fantasy author who now lives in Ohio. And um, I write, I've uh, written a uh, hundred or, or so uh, stories published in various magazines and anthologies and 15 or so novels. So uh, that's me. <laughs> Great. Your comment for me about categorizing things reminds me um, our uh, library just restarted at letting people browse through things. But right now, all of the science fiction is in a section that's labeled something like spirit things or I don't know they made up some weird name and I'm like supernatural <laughs> all science fiction is not supernatural ah anyway um so we we uh talked a little bit before we started and uh about starting with the question of what counts as an apocalypse how do you how do you define it how do we recognize it um and do different cultures or places might they might they consider it something different? Feel free to just jump in if you want. Well, I think uh, some of us came kind of out of the panel, that the COVID effects panel that we were talking about on Friday that I was on, and uh, and, and also a couple other panels that I've done this year with Wi-Fi Sci-Fi. Um, when people say apocalypse, what do we mean? We Everyone goes, oh, well, we mean the end of the world. But no one means the physical world. We know that the planet itself is going to go on. What we mean mm. is the end of our lifestyle. And when you think about it, that's almost, I don't want to say ridiculous, but it's preposterous when you look at a planet of almost 8 billion people and how many, quote, different lifestyles, unquote, they are. Mm. But you have to drill down one more level and say, when we say apocalypse, what we mean is the loss of a Western lifestyle with electricity and internet and, um, cars and getting groceries delivered and being able to go to Starbucks. Because when you ask people about these post-apocalyptic books and they say, God, it's terrible in this book. Listen, they lose electricity and running water and they have to be hunters and gatherers and they live in these <gasps> mud huts and they can't check Twitter. And you're like, okay, so all the people in the world right now uh, millions or hundreds of millions of people that don't have electricity, that live fine without running water, that are hunters and gatherers, that do live in mud huts, and that don't have a Twitter account. <laughs> um, you're saying right now that to live like them would be the end of the world for you? Mm -hmm. And they go, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> terrible. Like, I can't go get my pink drink from Starbucks. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> So to yeah. me, I think the definition of an apocalypse is that it's a great leveler, that if it's a true apocalypse, there shouldn't be anyone in the world that isn't affected and that there shouldn't be anyone that they don't know that the apocalypse has happened. So yeah. something like a, an asteroid strike or like um, the super flu in the plague, uh, in the stand or something. That seems I've been looking at it a lot, you know, that, that made me think of two different things about uh, ways we narrativize concepts of apocalypse, one in terms of history, one in terms of power. Uh, because I think one of the things, I'll do the power one first because it's a little shorter. Um, one of the things that's very common in apocalyptic fiction narratives is the idea that the apocalypse is a thing which suddenly makes somebody who was powerless before have the protagonist ability to be the main person on whom the narrative now rests and with whom the power now is. Mm. That it takes away the power structures that were there and enables X person or X couple of people to suddenly step into the heroic center and be either the last survivor in the city or you know the leader of the resistance against the zombies or whatever it is. Uh, and therefore we get a lot of great stories about you know people coming into a state where they can have power and act, but also a lot of sort of terrible power fantasy stories about, you know, the world getting smashed and suddenly, you know, my lifestyle and, and preparedness for the thing is, you know, what saves the day and makes me be the hero. And so I think, you know, similarly to a real apocalypse ought to be something that affects everybody. A lot of our narratives about apocalypse are very much just about destroying the existing power structure so that power has to rest with 
a person who was disempowered before. Uh, mm. and, and that that can be a very positive narrative, but it can also be a very negative narrative. Sometimes it's a person who thinks, I'm sorry. Because sometimes it's a person who just thinks that they've been disempowered. Mm. And sort of hold on to that. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe they haven't had power, but they view themselves as a hero, but they're not. Um, like I recently read Lucifer's Hammer. So that, that is a case where a large proportion of a, a comet strikes the planet. And um, I think just to make it manageable, as far as a, a story, they basically made that a disastrous situation for pretty much everybody except the highlands of California to somewhere in Utah. And, um, and so you have a whole bunch of different characters and some of them have certain types of resources or outlooks and scientists. There are definitely, like Premi was saying, there is a component um, there who realize that one of, the, one of the biggest resources they may or may not have, at first they don't know, is that there was a nuclear power plant in the area that might've survived. And so they're like, if we can save the nuclear power plant, then we don't have to go all the way back to no electricity forever or you know for a long time until we develop it again um but in the also, meantime there won't be an exploding nuclear power plant hopefully good. yeah uh that too separate but, uh, <laughs> but um but in the book there's also um there were there was a whole religious cult that at first was like yes yes you know bring this this hammer upon us this is god's judgment and we will all be uplifted into heaven and, and then that doesn't happen. And the cult leader is, is stunned that he's alive, but uh, not glorified. And then he uh, decides that this is really God's message that our previous way of living was uh, sinful and, and horrible. And we should go back to that sort of agrarian society. And therefore he um, ends up combining with some other people who had other motives and, and creating this sort of horde army th that wants to tear down everybody else's attempts to preserve you know, technological civilization. And so that's kind of the, the central conflict. Bogie, did you have thoughts on what, yeah. what is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would go back a bit to what Trimi was saying about uh, how like, um, uh, both uh, how like apocalypses are not evenly distributed and uh, and resources are not evenly distributed and I feel like there has been a lot of discussion of this in the past couple of years within indigenous futurisms in particular where people would say okay you say oh the apocalypse is coming but we have already had an apocalypse and I feel like that's true of a lot of different marginalized people in general and um and, uh, and it absolutely shows in the storytelling, I feel, even if the focus is not on an apocalypse. So one thing that I kind of noticed when I was making a list of uh, books for, for the panel is that um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of books, especially by marginalized authors, uh, tend to have a structure where you see that the present is something where the past has already been disrupted but the focus is not necessarily on how that disruption came to be, but rather maybe a further threat that comes after that. So mm -hmm. that the disruption is in the past. And uh, this made me think about, uh, uh, for example, Malka Older's Infomocracy, where uh, they have a radically different social structure uh, than the present, but mm -hmm. the focus is not on how this social structure came to be, uh, but rather it is to threats to this uh, social structure that had already come to be in the past. Mm. So uh, I feel like that, uh, or another example like this, uh, that also really engages with empire and then the what this empire is, uh, Prism Stalker by Sloane Leong. Um, 
where uh, the focus is on a kind of like magic school situation where the protagonist goes uh, to a specific type of uh, kind of imperialist uh, training, uh, but the protagonist has a different indigenous background and that of course affects uh, uh, both the past and uh, and this is a very 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 far future story with uh, like organic spaceships and things like that uh, but um, but here we already see okay there was a disruption but it was in the past and the story is about a completely different disruption mm -hmm. yeah just a technical point there um, at one point your voice got a lot clearer and then we heard some noises. I'm wondering if you're on a laptop and your left hand has a tendency to- Ah, that's as possible. Yeah, I'll try to maybe so. put it up like this. Yeah. Don't block the microphone. Okay, okay, okay I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually not sure where the microphone is on this one, but I'll try It to should be it. right at the left, because when you lifted your left hand, the noises stopped, so. Ah, okay, <laughs> thank right you. Right at the left-hand corner of your laptop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I love the the two things that Premi and Ada were talking about in that uh, one, you know, uh, yes, there's like this, uh, you know, the question of what is the apocalypse and 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 how is it distributed? Uh, I grew up with hurricanes, right? So it was felt like every four years there was an apocalypse, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, whenever I read or see apocalyptic fiction, I was always really bouncing off of it because the way in which people reacted was never the way in which my communities reacted, right? Um, it was always this case of, yes, hurricanes are traumatizing, but they're not traumatizing until about four or five months after, right? The actual apocalypse is like this really shared event and that brings you together in this really odd way, right? The same reason that the uh, bombing uh, countries really, really heavily doesn't really work to, to spirit them. It actually lifts spirits like the Blitz made all of uh, London feel like they were in it together. Um, a hurricane does kind of the same thing. And so for the four months after, everyone's very specifically focused on like cleaning up and, and the sort of next steps. And then it's about four or five months in that you start to get mental health problems because the, suddenly the magnitude of the task becomes real and disaster recovery is a, you know, uh, anywhere from a five to 10 year process, right? Um, and that's when uh, the weight of it actually begins to cause fractures. You see uh, death rates go up in the obituaries. Um, you see uh, uh, self-harm go up. You see mental health issues go up um, in terms of phone calls. Um, the FEMA actually has like a really specific timeline of what resources you need where uh, for like a, a five-year period after a natural disaster. Um, and they have it down to the month, how human beings as a community react and what kind of what you go through. Um, and you never see this uh, pretty much in fiction. Um, and uh, so that's uh, one of the things that, that uh, hits me. The other thing is, of course, the uneven distribution of apocalypses, because um, as Premi was saying, I think it was like, you know, the, there are people right now who live what certain people are calling an apocalypse. This fascinates me to no end, because um, having done a survey of apocalyptic literature when I was in university, um, I kind of like sat down and wrote out all the different kinds of apocalypses they were. And every single one of those are not just faced by people uh, in outside of the US in like Papua New Guinea or the Amazon, but like most of the apocalypses are faced by people within the US right now, right? You can go to, uh, you know, you can go to a, a, a under um, invested uh, area where, uh, you know, drugs are being kicked, you know, are, uh, the police are kicking down doors for that. Right there's your Orwellian 1984 apocalypse. Right, mm -hmm. um, you have places where there is a religious uh, community that dominates. So you get your Handmaid's Tale kind of feeling. Like Atwood said, I didn't make up anything for any of these books. These are all features of societies that exist today, um, mm -hmm. and you can just sort of plink your way around uh, e ecological destruction. I'm sure Premi should could tell us a bunch of examples of people who are going through sort of like almost nuclear wasteland type events right right here in this country um one of my uh i have an uncle who was a super fund investigator uh some of the stuff he told me was just like worse than like you know the day after um you know where communities would be near something that was just horrific um and so that's one of the things you know i think of william gibson's quote a lot which is that everyone took that to mean the future was unevenly distributed to mean all the cool stuff is here somewhere and we just haven't gotten it yet but I also think there's this reverse of it that always uh, is in my head, uh, which is that the, 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 the 
other stuff is here too at the same time. Um, and the very last thing is just as a writer, as a, as, as a thinker, I was always really frustrated by these visions of the apocalypse that are basically uh, first person uh, shooter fantasies because, mm -hmm. um, you know, communities come together, but also I just had a lot of questions about the world building because I thought, you know, the Mad Max situation doesn't make any sense because we've gotten all the easily available oil. They would be killing each other over Priuses, right? Like <laughs> Teslas would have like, you know, horns on the front of them and like <laughs> battle paint and someone with a spear strap to the top, right? And they would be trying to like knock over a shipment of, of solar panels, right? You know, like those solar panels would be currency, right? That's, <laughs> that would be the gold of the future. It's kind of like Ada was saying about the, the role-playing game, right? It, everybody has skills that would potentially be brought to bear. Mm -hmm. and maybe be more interesting to think of that wide variety of, of, of people who could be resources. Dave, you? Yeah, I was, uh, sorry, I was muted earlier, so I, oh. I spoke up um, unaffectedly. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm like responding a lot to what Bogie said about um, the narratives from marginalized communities often taking place much later than the like inciting events of an apocalypse. Mm -hmm. and, and I've definitely found myself drawn to that. Um, even like, like when I like the submissions criteria for that um, anthology was like, don't tell us how it ended. It was, you know, go to how communities are, you know, surviving and thriving now. But I, don't, I didn't really process why I liked that. And I actually feel like it's because so often the stories about what people are doing in the moment are so much these, these like power fantasies from, from folks who are in power now trying to like hold on to that power, which is not really interesting to me. Um, and actually- Well, to briefly expand on that, I think often it's, a, it's also people who are in power, but feel like they aren't in power, right? Okay. Because it's somebody who's you know in America, fairly wealthy with electricity, et cetera, but feeling, you know, disillusioned and powerlessness for their voice to like have sway in government. And so it's this weird believing that you're powerless yes. while actually being in the privileged category. Power. Yeah, and it's yes. like, then you have, you know, toxic masculinity, like power story, like, and it's like, who wants to read that? Um, certain people maybe, but like uh, the only time I can think of, cause like fifth season actually is one where um, it's it's you're seeing someone reacting to their community as the thing is happening, mm -hmm. um, but I wonder if just because it it um, wasn't written in that toxic masculinity mold, it doesn't fall into those traps, and so it manages to feel really fresh and cool. Um, uh, whereas like so many of the other stories that um, uh, I find myself drawn to, both in fiction and um, I'm really drawn to. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all have. Um, the role-playing games, either Apocalypse World or Dream Askew. Yeah. They're, they're about community building without thinking about what actually caused the end. And so well, it's, I think post-apocalyptic is an amazing RPG setting because it suddenly explodes and expands the breadth of the range of moral choices that the characters have to make. But by having it be an RPG where there are five or six people who are each their own POV's protagonist but have to cooperate, it does exactly what most apocalypse stories don't do in terms of complicating decision making and making teamwork be a center while still using the protagonismal focus from the POV of each player, which I think is why it's such a great genre for RPG specifically. Yeah, Ada, you know, we should have a sidebar about that some other time. <laughs> yeah. I think Dave has a really good point uh, about the sort of toxic masculinity. Uh, I saw someone who said something, I just posted it to the group, but. Um, it, you know, it turned out for COVID, we didn't need big, strong men who could shoot, but we actually needed men who could just shut up and wear a mask and sew them. <laughs> like, <Please. Yeah>. uh, <laughs> and I take care of the kids because there's like, you know, limited childcare options. You know, right. we, saw the, we saw that one guy that made his wife quit her successful business oh. because he couldn't take care of a kid for more than 48 hours, 48 hours. And he made her shut everything down and she took it like, okay. Like you couldn't take care of a kid for 48 hours. I've had a kidney stone for 48 hours. You right. can do anything for 48 hours. <laughs> well, and I, as someone who has a kid, I remember when she was young, there would be times when my spouse would be like, 
this is so hard for me. This is easier for you. And I was like, no, it's just that I already did the hard thing that you need to do. I was like, I need to leave you with this child for six hours so that you experience what happens when the child misses her snack instead of just always sending you with a snack. I need you to be motivated to understand the impact of it and you know, have solutions to hand, um, that sort of thing. Um, I wanted to maybe segue off of something that Tobias said earlier about um, hurricanes in the Caribbean and how effects can be delayed. Um, effects can also be distributed. And right now we have a model in the United States where we might declare an area a disaster zone and then all kinds of extra resources go to the area of the disaster. But then um, there are of course people who aren't in that area. Um, like for instance, here in York, we have a very large Puerto Rican population already. And then a lot of people just came here to stay with their families and figure out what they were doing next because their their situation on the island was was not good. And so, you know, people have asked, well, what can what can we do? And I'm like, well, we need a lot more bilingual educational materials. We need bilingual training more for our teachers because our our whole bilingual student population just went out the roof and, and more of them are really not very bilingual. They're they're pretty much just Spanish speaking. And um and it, you know, like there were just all these all these things. I'm wondering, you just held up, was that exile, Dave? Yeah, sorry, you mentioned um, like hyper-specific yeah. apocalypse, and I, I thought about um, Exile by Lisa Bradley, um, which is actually similar to Puerto Rico in some ways, because it's another place where they experienced, you know, basically like local apocalypse and then did not get the resources they need, mm -hmm. and instead it was contained, right? So um, with the accompanying... It, I guess it's more of just like a continuing what we have right now, right? Where like some folks are living in collapse and other people aren't. But like mm -hmm. the the idea that um, you can create scarcity and uh, apocalypse-like scenarios just by depriving people of what they need in order to like get back on their feet. Mm -hmm. well, the, this uh, makes me think of actually as something that we unfortunately are being pushed to work, which is basically create sacrifice zones. So I guess if you extrapolate that to fiction, so it basically would be an area where um, really heavy industry, really say contaminating or uh, you know extensive industry would be placed so that it isn't like spread out. So this is the zone where everything is super bad, but that's what allows everything around it to be super nice and not be touched and avoid all those cumulative effects. And I'm trying to think, are is there fiction sort like, so Exile Zone sounds like it might be, but is, is there, uh, are there stories out there where there's something like that, where say a government says, okay, we'll allow the apocalypse to happen over here. And uh, that means that life will be better for everyone else out there. Or is that kind of happening involuntarily? I, now I, I think, think it might be, but also very much the ones who walk away from Omalas. Yeah. You know, the rest of the society is doing great because of mm. you know, the child locked up in the closets. Mm -hmm. I think we sometimes depict that in inequality focused dystopian literature like Hunger Games, where by crushing X we have Y, but it isn't discussed as apocalypse, it's discussed as dystopia. Uh, <laughs> but of course the blur space between the two is, is interestingly porous uh, and point of view focused. Um, yeah, you see that also in, for instance, um, Scott Westerfield's Uglies series you have the two separated populations. And you see that in a lot of fantasies about, you know, we'll survive in our bunker because we prepared <laughs> thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a friend of a friend who, who is an engineer who builds bunkers and, and, and meets a lot of people, you know, rich people who actually do invest in making an apocalyptic bunker uh, and advising, you know, he's also a security expert. And, uh, what he told me is that he keeps going to these meetings with people expecting or used to expecting practical questions like, you know, how do I make my farming work long term in an apocalyptic situation? How do I work with the community? And that everybody's top question is always once civilization ends, how do I make my guards stay loyal to me? That that because 
somebody who's obsessed with that kind of narrative is also obsessed with the idea that people will never help each other and cooperate and work together. And, wow. and that you know, sort of hierarchy of power, because uh, another thing that Apocalypse shows you is what the author thinks about human nature. Yes. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And a lot of the time it's, this degenerates into people maximizing vice A, vice B, and vice C. And you get something that's basically Dante's Inferno on Earth uh, as our protagonist tours the different cabals that humanity degenerated into. Well, when you say guards too, I mean, clearly that person is not bunkering up with their family. Like, right. just, so there's just, like, inherent in that is, is something about themselves that is troublesome um yeah go on oh one, uh, no, one, one of the really great um i'm sorry bogey oh uh, no go ahead oh uh i was gonna say like as an antidote to all that one of my favorite uh, books that came out lately about the apocalypse was uh, bannerless by carrie vaughn which actually takes these sort of community building um really uh kind of mulls over how we would survive apocalypse and it's a lot of co-ops and distributed families and, you know, finding finding the solar power and living within our means while slowly growing out to where we need and what kind of society would develop around that? What kind of social reaction would we have? Um, and how would we change? And how would we view the past? Um, and it's a, you know, a really interesting book. Bannerless is one of my favorite books uh, about the apocalypse period. Um, and not enough people have read it because it's amazing. But uh, yeah, that, that was one of my favorites. And you also see a little bit of that in Lucifer's Hammer, the, the Purnell Niven book that I mentioned before. There's a, a group that basically says, if we do not live communally, we will not make it. And so they send people around and demand that everybody uh, submit to a resource assessment. They create a resource map to see who has what. Do people have seeds? Do people have chickens? You know, all this sort of stuff so that they can do a, a really broad assessment of what do we have and can we do this? And then it becomes, you know, against the group's rules to hide things. Like they're like, we won't necessarily take it from you, but if you hide it from us, then you'll go up in front of a panel and you might get kicked out of the community. Um, and um, because, and I, th I thought that was a, a fascinating sort of, uh, sort of point. Bogu, you, you were gonna say something? Yeah. Yes, uh, I was just wondering about what Dave said and how like these types of, oh, we are bunkering down in the bunker types of stories uh, and how will my guards be loyal to me? What Ada said, how this never combined with the like queer found family tropes and it never gets to that type of cooperation or anything, but instead like the assumption is that uh, like basically like, uh, as they said in Rome, man is man's wolf. Uh, and the other thing that I was thinking about, about this and what Primi said about the geographically constrained apocalypses and also the exile that they brought is that I feel that there is also kind of like a subgenre of uh, a post-apocalyptic uh, stuff that was inspired specifically by the Chernobyl disaster. Mm. And um, there it's like geographically relatively contained because it's in one, it starts from one specific uh, disaster, but also there's a theme of like contamination where, um, and, and the stories are about, ah, okay, you are the scary mutant and things mm. like that. And um, just to bring a relatively like well-known example, uh, the Witcher, uh, in The Witcher, there's constantly like, okay, you are the Witcher, you are a mutant, and you have been deliberately made into a mutant, isn't that horrible? And, and, and The Witcher experiences a lot of discrimination along with this. And so this is also like, uh, and, and that's, that's similar to what Primi was saying about sacrifice zones, but here like the sacrifice zone is like within the person. And they are like, okay, we can be fine if the Witcher becomes a mutant and then uses his mutant powers to hunt down the monsters. So, uh, and mm. I feel like here there's a difference between like Eastern European types of storytelling and like kind of, I don't know, American types of storytelling. Okay. And this also comes into play with like different adaptations of like the same story, like The Witcher has this TV show, but it's kind of different from the books. And the game is also different from the books, but in other ways, etc. So there's like different takes on the same thing. 
Mm -hmm. So how would you guys prepare for the, the apocalypse? I mean, is there a you know science fiction way of preparing? Do you, does anyone have a bunker? At some point I want to talk about the Black Death, but we could okay. talk about preparing for the apocalypse first. Well, you, how would you prepare for the Black Death? I mean, um, I would. You marry what? your guards. What? Step one is you marry your guards. Yeah. <laughs> really? uh, or find, you know, nubile spouses, partners for them. You know, doesn't have to be you, right? Well, in saying? a funny way, I ended up feeling like we accidentally prepared for the COVID apocalypse in exactly the way that stereotypically you do, but doesn't help because by impossible coincidence, we had just like the week before things got bad, put in our annual, we order uh, a year's worth of canned goods, and dry goods order all at once. And also <laughs> uh, a housemaid's sister who works at Procter & Gamble had given us a giant truck full of toilet paper and, and paper towels. So we just had this hoard and you know, it was slightly convenient. Having Embarrassing. That. It was, yeah, it was, you know, it was kind of weird, but, uh, but it wasn't what you needed because what you actually need is emotional support, connecting with people, the, the teamwork, the social relations, you know, what we needed was our discord community, uh, much more than we needed the, the hoard of toilet paper. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, because the human resources, uh, which are what combat the mental health epidemic side of disaster and which are what provide the robustness because you never have all of everything you need. You want to share that and you want to, oh, your friend needs the, the toilet paper, you bring it to them and they help you with cheese and you know that. So how do you prepare for the apocalypse? By having lots of people's contact info and, <laughs> and contact plans and you know, having thought about, oh, here is how, you know, here is where our neighborhood would meet if the power is all out and we need to talk to each other. And here is the string for the string can telephone system. <laughs> An alternate contact info, right? Like here in this concom it, for this event, we're also focused on email, and then and then we have uh, we had a situation where somebody went offline, and then like people were pinging each other. Does anybody have his phone number? You know, like because we just hadn't shared those. The, uh, yeah, I was actually. The, the, oh, sorry, sorry. For me. Oh no, I was just going to say I was uh, I was laughing when Ada was talking because virtually the exact same thing happened to me. So when everything started to lock down, about a week before that, I had gotten an enormous grocery delivery and deep cleaned my house because a friend was supposed to be coming to stay with me for about a week. And um, she canceled. And then I'm sitting there on like March 14th with, I'm like, oh, look at all this stuff and this food and this toilet paper and these Lysol wipes. What am I going to do with all this? And the pandemic was like, what's up? Can I come in? <laughs> really though, I think... And, and the bunker thing just baffles me too in all these post-apocalyptic situations. It always strikes me that wouldn't what you really want is to be mobile, to be able to get around easily with, with your resources and to be able to like gather up other people. I think of like, like the girl with all the gifts, they've got that sort of traveling lab and you can you know pick people up and put into it. And also with what maybe I don't want to say a climate apocalypse, but with climate change, there's going to be so much more flooding. If you look at people in Bangladesh who build their houses on stilts, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I think the next logical thing in an apocalypse that is going to be very, very important for people is uh, mobility and to have things like houseboats instead of houses on stilts, instead of you know the bunker, instead of keeping people in one place, being able to move around to help people and to get resources. Well, that mm -hmm. ties to what Ann had said about how they flood one area as if the disaster is there, whereas in fact it moves around. We need to decenter thinking about the world as being geography and a person tied to place, because it's just not true. Our world is really mobile and interconnected. And yeah. always it wasn't like that's a 20th, 20th century invention, right? Like it goes back to our earliest archeological digs are like, why is this showing up here when it's usually a feature of something way over there? Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing is uh, preparation for me. I was really lucky in that uh, I've, I, I found a really strong community in the small town I live in. So uh, my wife works on a co-op farm. So we have access to fresh veggies during growing season. Um, we have friends who uh, are routinely making a really long trip up to the, you know, Costco is like a hour drive for us. So but, you know, different people are always like, hey, we're at Costco. Do you want anything? 
Um, we have uh, just, uh, you know, we know who has pickup trucks. We know who has, you know, there's just a sort of like, you know, knowing and uh, having a, a community allows you to kind of uh, uh, survive it together by doing that thing, you know, uh, passing resources around or passing help around, um, as well as keeping each other sane. So like my biggest thing has been, uh, we, we've stopped doing it because we're all getting ready for the new semester. Um, but it'll probably start up next. I was under a book deadline too, but we were, the, the hardest problem for us to solve wasn't any of that other stuff. Lockdown was fine. We figured out how to do that. You know, uh, we, we figured out how to get masks and, and all that, but it was like, how do we continue movie night? Right. Yeah. Cause it's like eight of us always get together on, you know, a certain day and we watch a, a you know, a, a movie and, and uh, we be, we're, we're social. And so we're like, how do we solve that? And so there was this period of a month of us trying out like Discord and 2-7 synchronization app for Netflix. And like, I've tried out like six or seven different synchronization services for us all to like be able to like chat with each other while watching the same thing at the same time. You know, I was yeah, like- Yeah, an audience member asks what innovations could save us in a traditional post-apocalypse where destruction of shelter and resources and drastically reduced population are problems. and. Uh, I, I'm interested in what you think of this, but I, I have to say that a lot of people were like, oh, COVID, we're all gonna die. And I was like, I kind of too blase really, but I was like, well, there's too many of us. So that might be helpful for the whole planet. Um, Dave, did you wanna say something about how to prepare? Um, yes, I'm having a reaction to the overpopulation thing, but we can <laughs> yeah. that for a different day. Um, uh, I feel like the thing that would say this would be like a trauma informed approach to mm. connection. <laughs> yeah. There. That's yeah. where I would start. You see how yeah. often it's a humanities or social science solution, not a tech solution. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I also feel like there's the assumption that, oh, we can all rely on our social networks and, mm -hmm. oh, we have like a lot of connections, etc. And I feel like that's not necessarily everybody's experience either. And like one thing that I would relate to and how I was talking about like individual. Uh, individual sites of like uh, apocalypse and things like that is that immigration can be extremely disruptive about this and uh, and that is something that is not considered as uh, it's not considered an apocalypse it's considered people just coming and going but but the actual experience of it can be okay here you are in your town you know maybe your family members if you're lucky enough to have them and beyond that, I don't know, maybe your neighbors refuse to talk to you because you have an accent or which is mm -hmm. legitimately a thing that happens. So it's like difficult to go like, oh, here we have all these like uh, resources that we can use, but they're not necessarily resources that anybody and, and everybody can use. Or who and will so, work together, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I would like also emphasize like making sure who are the specific people who don't have a specific resource. Uh, because, okay, maybe we might have X, Y, Z resource, but um, that's not necessarily universally true. So we need to be mindful of that. So there's uh, Malka Older uh, talks a lot about this and just that like governments are not, uh, they focus on just the uh, the the physical damage and 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 temporary relief, um, and she says that all over the world uh, we just don't have this sort of like whole body kind of approach to this, right? We don't look for the people who don't have community. We don't look for uh, the trauma-based stuff. We're we're our our science of uh, recovering from this stuff and dealing with it and building a society that is tough enough to deal with these things constantly because they're only going to increase as a result of climate change and as a result of uh, being so connected. We're gonna have more pandemics. We're gonna have more storms. So we have to figure out like, how can we build a society in which that uh, we can constantly deal with these things? And I know it's doable because um, one of the things that was interesting to me about spending some time in Bermuda, I spent three weeks there, which wasn't very long, but Bermuda has a, it, there's this invisible stuff. You have to, as a culture, bake a lot of stuff in and Bermuda um, doesn't have it all figured out but everything from their building codes to the way uh, their buildings are designed to the way uh, uh, people know what to do uh, is premised around the idea that we're a tiny little island in the middle of the Atlantic that gets hit by hurricanes multiple times a year guaranteed and we can never we can never get away from that so since the 17 1800s everyone on Bermuda has just sort of baked that in 
to their entire worldview. Um, and it was amazing. I was there for a small hurricane. Um, and it was amazing just how much faster they were at any, than any other island I've ever been on at just recovering and getting on with business and check. They had all this stuff just baked in socially that I was like, wow. And they didn't even notice a lot of it. I was, you know, I'd be like, you know, like, this is interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. I want to, I want to um, take that to the rest of the panel also in the form of a question that did come from the audience. Jude Marie Green said, okay, but I want to talk about the black death. There's only five minutes. <laughs> you can in a second. Yeah. Um, so um, just if anybody has any other cultures to, to, um, to suggest, the question was in a worldwide apocalypse, what culture would bootstrap to normal, you know, for them fastest? Um, Primi's already mentioned, you know, other cultures that, you know, they already build their houses out of mud and grass. And so they, it's not that hard to start. No, I, I think what, uh, what I would probably say to that is anything that's reasonably resilient because it is decentralized and flexible. So uh, places maybe that have a uh, smart grid and renewable energy to quote, get back to normal, uh, places that have smaller local governments, um, you know, smaller uh, water and hygiene and uh, sewage, things like that. Places that can take a hit and roll because the infrastructure isn't so big that it can't flex. So just decentralized, anything like that. I even think like, you know, uh, maybe like a small town in Scandinavia or something would just take the hit and roll. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay, Ada, Black Death. Uh, just very, very quickly, uh, this is putting on my historian hat. Uh, as COVID started, everybody who, like me, works on the Black Death has been inundated with reporters wanting to do op-eds and people wanting to ask questions and you know versions of this. And I put a link to my long answer. But it's very clear from the questions you get. The story people are used to about the Black Death hugely informs the way we imagine other apocalypses. Because the story people are used to is, it swept through, almost everybody died, it went away, and the few people who survived then got rich, which is what we thought was true about the Black Death in about 1965, and is the story that made it into the textbooks. And we've realized that that wasn't true, and that it's not, but it still informs the way people imagine an apocalypse will work. And the other thing that does so in the same way are old ideas about what the fall of Rome was like, is the old narrative of the fall of Rome is, Civilization collapsed, everybody immediately lost all the technology and you know, small warlords and cults is what takes over and the darkest person in each area becomes the baron of his town, which is the way we narrativized the fall of Rome you know, 50 years ago. And a lot of our apocalypses repeat the archetype of 50 years ago's version of the Black Death or 50 years ago's version of the fall of Rome. Uh, as opposed to if you look at the current ideas about them where we've learned a lot about how differently they work. Uh, mm -hmm. And the link I did gives a very detailed analysis for Black Death, but the really fun micro example is very few communities are totally wiped out, but the ones that are totally wiped out, as Tobias was saying, it's not during, it's way after. So one of the victims we didn't realize was a victim of the Black Death is Black Death comes in 1348, by 1415, there are no longer Vikings living in Greenland. The Vikings in Greenland didn't get the Black Death, but the economy changing meant the bottom dropped out of the walrus market, which was their only economy. Oh, wow. So there's no walrus market and they all didn't have any income and they had to abandon their civilization and, and move back to Europe and become peasant farmers because you know, the, the apocalypse, which was then 65 years ago, disrupted the bit of the economy that their village and their way of life depended on. That's what gets wiped out. But the fantasy of the way we used to narrativize it still dominates so much of the way people imagine apocalypses as either fall of Rome or Black Death. Yeah, I, I recently read 1491, which talks mm -hmm. about the Americas before um, Columbus and the other Europeans arrived. And of course they brought with them terrible disease uh, as far as the impact and it was very interesting to read about um, you know the, the culture in the Andes and the Peruvian uh, ancient culture because like it, it was excellent as far as working before they got invaded it was extremely cooperative they had these these plots of land where everybody had their own job because they, it was all irrigated there was no there was no rain like uh, except up up in the mountains so it all had to come down 
And so they had to make the best possible use of it. And they had these roads and all this great travel and communication. And then as soon as they had a plague that they'd never experienced before, those all became issues. But um, okay, so we are at our last minute. Final thoughts. Maybe one more thing, just that, uh, uh, like which type of culture is resilient uh, toward the, uh, these apocalypses. I think one thing to consider is places which have a tradition of like jewelry rigging things, uh, which is kind of uh, prevalent where I'm from, uh, to build things cheaply from uh, spare materials and uh, come up with uh, like unconventional uh, solutions to things, which in the West would just be like, oh, okay, we can throw more money at this or we can throw more resources at this which isn't necessarily going to work in a different situation and probably not in the apocalypse either. Dave? Last thoughts? Creamy? Oh, I uh, think I shared mine. <laughs> okay. Toby? Tobias? Sorry. If you want to see, uh, again, a bannerless has the very slow apocalypse in it too that looks at uh, how it's the second and third order effects that really eventually get you to that point. So again, I just want to hype Carrie Fon's bannerless as being like the apocalypse done right. Um, I, I was just typing into the, the thing. Um, I, I wanted to mention if anybody's seen, hasn't seen the anime Nausicaa from Studio Ghibli, uh, I was reminded of it by Premi's comments about transportation. The main character has this awesome glider and she can go so far. Um, to, to bring resources back to her community or, or find out somebody is traveling near them. So, um, so that, uh, that reminded me of that. So thank you all for, I think this was a fascinating conversation. I took lots of notes and if you can join the audience in the discord later, um, somebody what room? we're in, Olin Tangy, um, even, even, I think. Yeah. Even, even. Right. Yep. Cause we started at noon, so all in tangy room even is the place to go next or, you know, go eat lunch. And or there's, both. there's the group autographing. Group.